Welcome. My name is Todd Tabutis, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Sarah Terry. Can you join me on screen? Hopefully. I'm trying to. There I am. There we go. Great. Welcome. Uh, a little, uh, a few notes for everybody who's joining us. First, uh, uh, live captioning is available this evening for the program. Find the captioning icon, click on that, and you should be able to access live captioning. Also tonight, we are not using the chat feature. We are using the Q&A feature. Not chat, but yes to Q&A. If you have questions for tonight's speaker, uh, type them there. Uh, our, my colleague, Heather Harris, Educational Programs Manager at the Art Museum, will be monitoring the Q&A in the background during Sarah's presentation. And then she will join us on screen for a full moderated Q&A afterwards. Um, so if you want to save your question until then, please do. I'm also very pleased to say that tonight's program is made possible in part by a Campus Read Grant from the WVU Humanities Center. And that is because this program is in conjunction with this year's Campus Read, a book called The Girl Who Smiled Beads, A Story of War and What Came After um, by Clementine Mamaria. So Sarah, welcome. Sarah is in Los Angeles. She is three hours behind where I am in Morgantown. So thank you for joining us in the virtual realm. Uh, Sarah is a documentarian, a filmmaker, a photographer, a journalist. She is a recipient of the prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. She's given a TEDx talk and we are happy she has decided to join us this evening uh, by Zoom. We wish you could be with us today uh, in person, but this will, this will have to do. Um, specifically, we've invited Sarah because she is the founder of the Aftermath Project. The Aftermath Project is a nonprofit organization Sarah started after a number of years working in uh, covering post-conflict Bosnia as a photographer and journalist. The Aftermath Project continues today as a way to help uh, photographers around the world tell, tell post-conflict and aftermath stories through photography. Sarah herself has done work uh, in this area in Africa, specifically in Sierra Leone and Rwanda, and we are delighted that she's joining us tonight to talk to us about what it means to use photography to tell aftermath and post-conflict stories. And there's a phrase that I know the Aftermath Project uses a lot as its founding phrase, and that is, war is only half the story. So with that, I'm going to invite Sarah to share her screen, make the presentation, and uh, we look forward to it. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you all for setting this up. I'm going to move into sharing my screen. We've ever been practicing this. Um, I know you all are out there. Um, and I bet you're just as tired as the rest of us of Zoom meetings and things like that. So I appreciate you being here. And oh my goodness, it is really one of the weirdest things in the whole world. And so stripping of our humanity for me to be like talking at my computer screen instead of your faces. Um, I know that you're um, uh, from African history classes and art history. That excites me particularly. Um, for the work that I wanted to show you tonight and the reading project you all have been engaged in. Um, I've known Todd for quite a while. He's shown my post-conflict work, some of which I'll, I'll show uh, tonight. He's exhibited in other places. Um, I do want to say one thing about the Aftermath Project, which I'm really excited about. After um, we're entering our 12th or 13th year of grant making, I basically wanted other people to do post-conflict storytelling, which nobody was doing at the time. So I like started a, a nonprofit, more work than I realized at the time, but um, I'm glad we did it. But starting in 2021 and for five years, the focus of our, um, of our grant is going to be the 1492 slash 1619 American Aftermaths Grant. Um, we feel it's time to devote a period of, of concentration and funding to uh, kind of overdue reckonings with America's uh, own sins. So um, the Aftermath Project, I don't think I've got it in my um, presentation, I should have, theaftermathproject.org. If you know anybody who's interested in that subject or might want to apply, uh, it's for still photographers. So I, I took my uh, title, um, Hidden on the Surface, Photographing Post-Conflict Stories, um, to, to show work that both relates uh, specifically to Rwanda, but also to thinking through um, why aftermath stories matter, you know, what they tell us. I come from journalism. I'm very aware of, of what the news media thinks news is. And in terms of conflict, that has, you know, historically been 
people blowing each other up, you know, nations fighting destruction, the worst kind of inhumanity, despite acts of heroism that happen in war. And I think there's other really far more important things to tell. And I think they're, they're equally newsworthy. I'm going to start first with showing you some of the Rwanda work because I want to help you understand, you may have already found this in your own um, studies, but Rwanda is a case uh, to me of where it hasn't been a healthy um, resolution to conflict, where uh, President Paul Kagame has, he, he really charmed a lot of the West. Um, he, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton all loved him. This was primarily because he created a great business environment in Rwanda for investment. Um, and it was seen as a healthy economy when in fact, much of Rwanda's economy, much of their touted you know, gains came from foreign aid. It wasn't an earned economy. Um, we could go into the things that Kagame has done and his, the authoritarian ways he's begun to govern Rwanda, the constitutional changes he's made so that he can stay president. But suffice it to say that when I went there, this was part of this project is called Forgiveness and Conflict Lessons from Africa. And when I went to Rwanda, um, I had to go. Um, I did not want to get a journalist visa. It was becoming... Um, very difficult. Journalists are, can't really criticize Kagame. And um, I went with my iPhone. I, I really love iPhones as cameras. I take them seriously. But I worked as a tourist because, and I had to be very, very careful because there is a network of, of spying within Rwanda. And I knew uh, foreign aid workers who spoke ill of Kagame, who 24 hours later, we're told they had to leave the country. So you're, people are very, very aware of not being able to speak freely. And there are a lot of things that are hidden on the surface in Rwanda. I had just spent, my previous post-conflict work was five years working in Bosnia. And one of the things about that war that, that, that was a, a primary cause was under Tito, um, the former Yugoslavia had had a, a slogan called unity and brotherhood and tito had quashed the ethnic identities of of the people in the balkans so if you were croatian or serb or bosniak which is muslim you could no longer discuss it so people didn't really know who they were and with tito's death and the disintegration of yugoslavia those rivalries uh because there have been so many conflicts in the past came back to the surface and what got me about Rwanda was I remember the day I read when Paul Kagame said, you can no longer say if you're um, Hutu or Tutsi, which of course was a source of that conflict when um, Hutus uh, caused that hideous genocide of, of Tutsis um, and some Hutus. So I, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is setting it up for a future disruption. What Kagame has done in Rwanda, and I've, I've spoken with a lot of my ex expat Rwanda friends, I learned a lot about it before I went. He is reshaping Rwanda uh, into um, a media representation of the Tutsi people uh, it, without calling it that. And you can tell, sadly, in Rwanda, it's something that the colonial empires really abused the physical characteristics of the of the population are general not always markers for tutsi and hutu um so i tried to do a metaphorical project while i was there it's called postcards from rwanda referencing my iphone about things that are hidden on the surface this is just a village where uh, somebody was working in agriculture and this hoe was left on the ground. That was a weapon during the genocide. That Things like that, farm tools, were used to kill people. There are the genocide, I, there's a few uh, images that may be disturbing to some of you. I'll, if you don't want to look at the screen right now, I can tell you when I switch it, but this is a genocide memorial. Rwanda has also, under Kagame, done a very strange thing in that instead of identifying bodies and returning them to their families, as has been done in other places like the Balkans. Everybody who lost a family member has been told they have to bring their remains to a Holocaust um, site in which the bodies are completely separated. So there is no longer any one identity left. There's always one or two graves of a person. And then everything else 
becomes this mass um, non-entity. And by the way, um, Kagami, when, he when the genocide was going on, uh, it's pretty well documented and widely known that his troops massacred Hutus in football stadiums. And, and that's also a hidden fact in, um, in Rwanda's history. Um, I'm moving on from this. Oh, and the other thing about the genocides, by the way, which led me to think about how a national story is being crafted by an autocratic government. I asked the woman who, who works with some of these uh, genocide museums, I said, well, what if somebody's uncle was killed in their backyard and they wanted to keep his remains there? And she said they would be visited by the education department and that eventually they would see the light and bring, their, bring the remains to a national memorial. So again, there's a very deliberate crafting of a story. Things are hidden on the surface. Uh, this is one of the most visible areas, uh, but also hidden on the surface. This is Miss Rwanda. Um, she most likely is Tutsi. Uh, it's the more slender body type and taller. Um, Hutus, I believe, are 87% of the population in Rwanda, and they tend to be shorter, uh, with an average height of five foot four. Dangerous to, to generalize physical characteristics and distinctions. And again, that, that was abused by the colonial powers, but it matters in understanding things like this. Rwanda is one of the few countries in the world that has a height requirement to enter the Miss Rwanda pageant, part of the, you know, the Miss World enterprise. You have to be a minimum of five feet, six inches tall to, be, to enter Miss Rwanda, which essentially means that 87% of the population is never gonna be that. So an image is being crafted again hidden on the surface. This is a Hutu woman. This is a fashion show in the capital in Kigali. Um, again, most likely um, a, a Tutsi woman, but that very slender, very Western figure being used to represent. Um, and this combination here, several of the designers in the show were bringing back like village elements of fashion and style. So it's another interesting like narrative being crafted. It all, it's just when you cannot speak openly in a country, when there's no real democratic opposition, when there are like laws in the capital that if you, you know, leave a piece of litter, you go to jail. I mean, that's how you can't run out of gasoline in Kigali or else you'll go to jail. That's the type of authoritarian control that he has. You have to understand how to read stories. Um, this is, uh, uh, in trying to work metaphorically, um, this, this person in this outfit is, is an exterminator. It's a very common sight. They're, he's going house to house um, and, and it, just exterminating for bugs. But during the genocide, part of the propaganda from the Hutus was to exterminate the Tutsis and moderate Hutus. It was to kill them like bugs. So um, th that isn't the intent of this person at all. But as an artist, I'm working to find, to be able to make imagery that, that speaks to what's hidden on the surface. This is in a wonderful um, tailor's shop, a new business in Kigali, one of the sort of thriving parts of the economy. Um, and again, I, to me, I was just drawn, those scissors would have been a weapon of murder in um, the period of the genocide. I'm not saying this person in this store would do that, um, but it's, it's, it's just a way of warning. You know, this is on the surface. If we're not careful, this could be, if all of that blew up, again, remember my premise being that if you subjugate tribal ethnic identities, uh, to such an extent that they can't be discussed. And I saw what happened in Yugoslavia and other places. What happens when that blows up? And I'm sure not like wishing for war on anybody. I, I realize I sound like I could be very negative there because I mean, Rwandans are amazing people and there have been genuine acts of forgiveness there. But there's just so much that's fraught here and the political moves and Kagame's um, moves to become president for life are really concerning. This references the history of uh, Tutsis and Hutu. Historically, you were known as a Tutsi. They were, they were the people who owned cattle and Hutus were the people who were the farmers, the agrarians. There were already cultural divides within um, the country in this part of Africa based on what you did and what you owned. Uh, again, colonial empires exploited it. 
but you could, I didn't know this, you could move from being a Tutsi to a Hutu if you lost your cattle. And you could move from Hutu to Tutsi if you gained them. So I'm just using this cow and the strain of that rope, you know, to suggest um, the tensions that are there. A lot of people escaped or ran through forests at the time. That broken branch to me is just, I'm warning, you know, it's a warning again to me. This is from Hotel Rwanda, um, which you all, if you know it, you know, certainly would know from the book, but also from the Hollywood film. Uh, hotel Rwanda was a very mixed story. The manager of the hotel actually, according to many of the people who were there, he extorted the people from the people who were in the hotel, you know, like he had, they had to pay him to be able to stay there. He, there's all kinds of mixed stories around that. And of course, in the crazy twisting world, this Rwanda right now, he has been arrested. He was kind of tricked into returning to Rwanda and Paul Kagame has arrested him and he's in jail for being a political opponent. And I just, this picture spoke to me of this kind of Western instrument against an African piece of art. And just again, suggesting um, conflicting worlds. And very much the little figures up at the very top of the picture of Nissa painting, which is for a restroom sign, but just men and women like get out. It, that chapter, it's called chapter six, Postcards from Rwanda. It's in my project, Forgiveness and Conflict Lessons from Africa. Um, and that's the website where you can find it. Feel free to do a screenshot if you want to um, follow that. I'm keeping an eye on my time here. Um, because we want to leave lots of rooms for questions or further discussion if you've got them. The, the, the next body of work I want to show you as a way to consider um, the importance of, of what comes after war is, you know, if we, if we don't have an understanding of what comes in the aftermath of conflict, um, we don't have foreign policy for it. We don't have narratives for it. We don't have healthcare services for it. There's so much that's in this space. And um, understanding trauma is, is one way to do this. This is, this is the part of the project that, that Todd has shown in other venues um, and has been a great supporter of. In, so the, the, my Forgiveness and Conflict project is in Sierra Leone, Northern Uganda, Rwanda, and South Africa. It includes a documentary film made in Sierra Leone. It's a fairly um, broad project. I worked in some other countries in um, Liberia and a few other places, but that's what's in the work. It, you can see it all on the Forgiveness and Conflict site. But you know, photographers talk a lot about, especially when you're dealing with stories about trauma, about not being extractive, not just trying to take somebody's story, I never ever think of my work as giving voice to somebody because everybody has a voice. I actually can't stand it when I hear people talk that way, that, oh, I'm giving voice to, you know, these women who were, you know, victims of rape during war. I'm giving voice to any number of things. It's like, you know what? No, everybody has a voice. I feel as a storyteller um, that sometimes I'm helping to create a space for the voice to be heard. I'm kind of creating the stage or the platform, but I'm always trying to honor um, the fact that the people I'm with and who are generous enough to give me their space and time, that I'm honoring their voices. And I was able to do that literally um, with this story. It's, it's, um, it's called In My Life, the story of an ex-girl soldier. Um, she was an amazing young woman who, had been married to one of the Bush married to one of the highest commanders in the war in Sierra Leone. Um, she'd been taken as a child and forced into that life. Uh, she was being, um, I met her through the special court. She was going to be testifying against Charles Taylor at the Hague. She's one of the most um, articulate people I'd ever met and being able to discuss what had happened. And she'd been, you know, rehearsed to be able to give testimony, but um, her name for this project is Miriam, but I, may, I can tell you her name is Gloria. She just had an incredible capacity to tell a story. And I was there with a the camera one day and we were talking and, and she said, why don't you teach me something? Why don't you come back and bring me a camera so that I can use a camera too? 
So I shot with a film camera and Gloria shot with my digital camera. And I had to hide her identity because of the special court coming up. She, I interviewed her. This is my writing on the pictures because um, I put this body of work together later. Um, I'd been able over time uh, to, I knew people who could, knew where Miriam was. I was able to give her some money uh, to, she wanted a sewing machine and materials. I, I, I've since, I can't, I don't know where she is, I've lost touch, but um, I tried to make this a very shared space. So these are just details of her life that she was, you know, um, taken by a rebel commander at the age of 11. She talked about being trained to fight. It was very unusual for girls to ever talk about having done anything wrong in that space. And this one day when Miriam, after I just showed her the very basics of the camera, she wanted to take me through this village that she was living in, not her home village. But she took me through the village because she, I, what I discovered was she wanted to tell me the story of what had happened to her in the war. So she was taking pictures, fiercely concentrating. We'd stop maybe for a minute, but then she kept walking. I was following her. And then we reviewed the cameras on the back of the digital frame and she told me about them. I worked with an interpreter because um, English wasn't a shared language for us. But um, she told me about the photos. This is, so this is Gloria's and I arranged them like a scrapbook, like a family album um, to, because she's, it's her life. This is the first chapter. And what she said about this photo was, these children bring back memories. They are the age of children abducted in the war. The rebels took children when they were small so that when they grew older, they would be a dangerous power, which is very much a tactic of the rebels to, to really kind of break a child young by making them kill their own family or friends as a way to start controlling them. Um, there are 12 in her, her series. Um, this, she went to this road, she knew she wanted to be here. And she said, when we were captured, they brought us to the road and raped us. Not only me, there were others, some younger than me. We were just girls. She saw this as we were walking through the village, they were making palm oil. And so she wanted to make this photograph and said, we forced people to do things like make palm oil. And then we took what they had made. Um, and this next, no, the next one is, uh, this football field is exactly like the one where I went through combat training. She made photographs of where she had, what was the place that was like when she'd given birth, uh, trees that they used to hide in. She made a really strong series of work, um, a, a really strong narrative retelling and her ability to do it and do it in such unflinching ways was just amazing to me. Um, and this next picture is a little hard, one of the harder ones in this talk, but she um, saw this hole being dug. And she, at first she took a photo from farther away and then she just walked with determination right up to it and looked right at this picture, right at this hole in the ground and took this photograph. And it's the one she chose. She chose all these pictures herself. Um, and she said, this hole reminds me of the time we buried a woman alive. Um, this, which was surely going to be part of her testimony at the special court. But this was how, part of how Gloria was dealing with her need to find forgiveness in this, the Forgiveness and Conflict project is based on trying to better understand uh, the tradition that's in many, many countries in Africa, which involves telling the truth, apologizing for what you've done, being forgiven because the the act of apologizing, the response to it is to forgive somebody, and then the act of reconciliation, um, which is in my film, um, Fomble Talk. We, we followed that in Sierra Leone, an amazing story about that there. But Gloria was really stuck because she didn't know who she'd hurt. She'd been taken far from her village. She was now living far from, from her home. She didn't know the names of anybody she'd hurt, so she didn't know how to apologize to them. She could not begin the the steps towards reconciliation that would have made her feel re reintegrated into society. So we, she took this picture, the top picture in the mosque, so that's where she goes to find forgiveness. She asked me, I took the bottom picture of her praying. There's, the, her words are pretty much there on the side that as I've written, and this is the last picture in the series in which she said, she asked me to take this picture um, and we're in the mosque. And she said, it's good for me to make these photographs it allows me to reflect on what has happened in my life. Um, and as I said, I stayed in touch with her during that period for as much as I could. And another person 
um, who knew her well, the people at the special court who'd been her counselors and kind of therapists, um, who all were able to, you know, comment on the power that Gloria had and felt in being able to tell her own story, as opposed to somebody else telling it or just recounting it for somebody else's gain. You know, this was a space and time in Gloria's life where she got to tell her story. Um, it was published a few places. I sent links, you know, so she could see it. Um, but I, I learned, I've, wor I've continued to work where I can and where it's appropriate in collaborative ways to allow people um, I, I'm not, there was a period of time when people gave camera, it was like, give cameras to street kids and change their lives. That a lot of photographers did that and acted like it, you know, it was sort of the greatest thing since I don't know what. It doesn't change anybody's life. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make something automatically better. It doesn't change anybody's income level or give them opportunities. Maybe once in a while a photographer gets found that way. But what I do think, um, sharing a camera with somebody does is is the agency that, that that they discover of being their own storyteller is a really really important part of um post-conflict storytelling and helping me understand and helping all of us understand how somebody is affected by that um that's also from the same um project same website and now i'm going to take you back a little bit to the first work i did um, it was in Bosnia. And this is the third type, mm, aspect of post-conflict storytelling I wanna to talk to you about, because I think it's where we define our humanity. If war is what defines our inhumanity, uh, apart from those exceptions of heroism, I think that post-conflict is where we define our humanity again, because it's where we have to learn to live again. Um, and as somebody said to me once about the Aftermath Project and post-conflict work, she said, we become what we hold up. And if the only things we hold up for ourselves are pictures of war and destruction and conflict, then who do we become? That, that's a question that drives me in my post-conflict work, and it's why I feel there have to be alternatives to conflict storytelling. I don't, I don't want to become that. That's not the world I, you know, I want to be part of building you know it's a it's a they're images of destruction and we also ultimately become inured to them we we just sort of go mm, right another war in the world what else is new and scroll down the screen a friend of mine used to say flip the page on the newspaper but to go into this work in bosnia i'm going to read you just a little bit i have a, a book of the work in bosnia it's called aftermath bosnia's long road to peace and i'm just going to read to you before you, i show you a few photos because um, I, this really it sets up why I believe um, in post-conflict, believe that post-conflict storytelling is so critical to our understanding of who we are. I should say from the beginning that I never flew into Sarajevo on a military cargo plane, listening anxiously for the sound of artillery fire. I never saw anyone killed in the infamous sniper alley that was a death trap during the three and a half year siege of Sarajevo by Serb forces. I never had a gun pointed in my face. I never feared for my life. I never interviewed a man who would die the next day, a woman who had been gang raped, a parent who had just buried a child, or a family that had fled the blood soaked soil of a village burned to the ground in the name of ethnic cleansing, which was genocide. And a few paragraphs later, I went to Bosnia to cover the aftermath of war, to try to capture the images that are the all too often forgotten companions of the vivid pictures of war itself. I came with the conviction that war is only half the story. I believed, and I still believe, that what happens in the aftermath of war is as newsworthy, if not more so, than the destruction and horror of war. I went to Bosnia with a desire to document that incredibly difficult period when humans move out of war's desperate struggle to survive and begin another equally mighty struggle, that of learning to live again. I became convinced that we need post-conflict images to remind us of our humanity, 
to testify that war is not the final word on who we are as human beings, nor the final image of our spirit. And that's the framing of my Bosnia work, my first post-conflict work. Um, it's a, the framing in many ways of the Aftermath Project. This is um, a signature image from the work. It's been exhibited in many places and is in many collections. It is not the title of the book or the cover photo of the book because I didn't want you to sort of look at an image like this and think you knew what Aftermath Bosnia's Long Road to Peace was about. It's a, this is a Muslim widow looking into remains that have been recovered from one of the sites of ethnic cleansing, massacres of Bosnian Muslims by Serbs primarily and Croatians, Bosnian Serbs. And for me, art history students, you'll see this in a heartbeat. My, as I came into photography, my work was more influenced by fine art than photography because I hadn't studied photography. I'm very influenced by Vermeer, as you can see, um, and the presence of light and the beauty of this space and moment was my way of saying to you as the viewer, come, come into this space with me because we've got to talk about some difficult things, but let's start on this threshold you know, of, of this very human space. This humanity in this period of time and the great sorrows that were there also included moments of great joy. This is the day that Donny Stanovic returned to Bosnia with the Oscar for his film, No Man's Land, about the war. Bosnians, you know, suffered greatly because, not only because of the war, but because the West just ignored it. Um, which we really did. The media paid attention, but we did, ignored it as, you know, countries and cultures for as long as we could. And this young woman is just throwing her head back in a moment of, of just joy of waiting for Tanovich. This is the kind of thing you encounter. Um, again, art students, you'll probably see, this was one of those moments when the photo gods are smiling um, down on you. I could see the, the this thing on the, I think it'll be on the left of your frame, but the red uh, rose or red enamel painting in the ground, it's called a rose of Sarajevo. And these are the spaces where Sarajevo is in a valley and the Serb forces were in, on the mountains above this. And, and the residents of Sarajevo endured a three and a half year long siege during that war. And these bomb blasts that were the most destructive were filled in after the war with red and called the roses of Sarajevo. Um, they would be chipped and got dusty over time. I, in the couple, I, I spent five years working on this project and it was always hard to find, like I couldn't get the right light. I couldn't show the red. Um, and this one day as I was coming, I was walking in the opposite direction. I was walking, this young man was facing me and I saw that the rain would let me catch the red. And, and of course he's on crutches. He, this isn't a war wound, but I, it, it's a visual representation of the memory of a war wound. And so I, I think I made three frames. This is done on, um, with a Leica camera and color slide film. So I didn't have a lot of time and I didn't have, you know, the focus is a tricky thing, but I turned as he passed me to take this photograph. And I was just so amazed because I had no idea that the back of his jacket would say pretty, you know, that the blue of the word pretty would echo the other blues that you see in the photograph. And most of all, that those two human bodies sitting back to back in red would echo the red of the rose and even more so the red of the piled chairs on the right hand side of the frame, which again, to me, as I saw it later, I, was a visual representation of the moment of that bomb blast. It, it was an echo. Um, you may not see that, that's okay. Um, I think uh, I'm gonna guess the art students, not, not discriminating against you African history students, but art history students are kind of, you know, taught to learn to work in metaphor and think through visual representation. So there are images like this. There are images like this. These, this is the bridge in Mostar that was built under the Ottoman Empire. This beautiful little delicate sigh of a bridge, a passenger bridge, was destroyed during the war. And it was the turning point for a lot of people who thought, who were trying to help Bosnia, who felt that that was the end of everything because it had been such a symbol. And this is the day that the bridge, um, after it had been rebuilt and was reopened, and this is one of the famous jumpers of Mostar jumping off that bridge. It's an 80 foot drop to a fairly shallow river and they would do it for tips. 
And I deliberately don't show you the river in this photograph because I'm showing you the joy and the daring and, and the, the free fall of what he's doing. But there's a big question about what Bosnia was gonna become in this post-conflict era. And I'm leaving that an open question by not showing you the river. I'm gonna go back a second. I'm just gonna let you know we're coming. This next picture is difficult. Um, there's two more I'm gonna show you and then we'll have conversations. Um, one of the toughest things for me to cover was the exhumations of the victims of those massacres, what got called ethnic cleansing, which was really an attempt to, to destroy the population of Bosnian Muslims. And um, numbers were inexact and graves had been dug and then uh, the Serbs would dig up the graves and, and build tertiary graves as a way to escape war crime convictions before the war ended. It was a tricky space and I could never find the right picture because I really, really, really hate exhumations. I would stand on the rim of the pit, make photographs, and I, I knew I'd never made the right photograph. And I was befriended by these two forensic anthropologists who took me to the exhumations with them. They were Polish people who were really devoted to the people of Bosnia, worked with the state. And um, one day, this one woman who's quite, she's a heroine in, in Bosnia, Eva Klonowski, she asked me to come into the grave and take a picture because she had found the, the preserved hands of a boy who'd been killed in the Srebrenica massacre in which some 8,000 Muslim boys and men were killed by Serb forces. And she wanted the picture for her um, forensic anthropology. And I stood in the mound. I'd never been in a grave pit before. And I took the picture and I nearly threw up. But as I made the photograph, I then picked up my own camera because I knew it was the image I'd been waiting for. So when people look at this picture, they often look away. And I always say, please look again, because this is a photograph of love. So I invite you to see this as a photograph of love. This is Eva in the grave and Piotr with her. And the tenderness with which Eva is holding this long dead boy's hands. It, it took me several months to realize that this is an echo of the Sistine Chapel where Jehovah is touching Adam with life. Piotr and Eva, Piotr and Eva believed that they were giving life back to every single one of these victims because they were giving them back their identities. You would go through a DNA mitochondrial process to identify the bodies, to reunite them with their families. The opposite of Rwanda, as I mentioned earlier. And it was bringing resolution and peace. And I realized for me, finally, when I made this picture, that this is where I wanna stand in post-conflict. I hate the evil that caused this. I, I hate the evil that made this war. But I want to stand with the humanity that shows up after it's over and says, no, you, you don't define who we are. You know, we reach into those graves with life and with commitment to human dignity. And, and, and this is probably one of the more important photos for me in my own career because of that. It says so much about where I stand. And then this is the last picture. And this is the cover of the book. I wound up taking, without even really thinking about it, a lot of pictures that had roads in them. But this was a man selling goldfish in a bowl on the side of the road. And I drove past it and drove past it. And a voice in my head kept saying, go back and take that photo. And I kept going, no, I'm tired. I want to get to the place I'm going for the weekend. And I went back to make this photo. And um, there's a wonderful, she's now the curator emerita of the Museum of Fine Art Houston of Photography, one of the most well-known photography curators in the world. And she championed my work in this project early on. And this is one of the pictures she chose for the museum. And um, she asked me if I thought it was a photograph about healing. And I said, oh, I think it's kind of how the world looked at Bosnia and a goldfish bull. And then I remember kind of going, oh my gosh, why do I care what I think? I'm talking to one of the smartest people in the photo world. And I stopped and I said, I don't know, Ann, what do you think? And she said, it's all about the desire for a return to beauty and light. So I want to hold this up. I, I, it's part of defining our humanity. I want us to become this. And even a you know, I know you're reading a book about Rwanda, which has so much about um, one woman's aftermath and what she struggled with. But, you know, we're in a world today that's going to have so many aftermaths. And I hope you 
all know and choose the images that you want to hold up you know whether it's in your own mind or whether it's what you're putting on your wall or whether it's the art that you're making yourself um because yeah there are photos and things that need to be made that tell how hard it was um but i have a desire and a hope for a return to beauty and life in our world today so um i'll leave it there and um we'll take questions if there are any all right Thank you, Sarah, for that wonderful talk and for a look at your work. Um, my name is Heather Harris, and I am the Educational Programs Manager at the Art Museum. As Todd alluded to at the beginning, I'll be managing our Q&A. Um, and I want to echo Todd's welcome and thanks to Sarah, but also our thanks to the West Virginia University Humanities Center who is helping to sponsor this in collaboration with the Campus Read. So before I take some questions from the audience, I think I'm going to take a, I'm going to offer a few that maybe draw some connections between Wamaria's book and Sarah's work and uh, kind of toss those to her um, as people are maybe thinking and typing in the Q&A box, if that's okay with you, Sarah. Um, so one of the things that struck me, there were many, many parallels between kind of what you were saying and what Romaria is saying about the experience of the um, uh, aftermath of the genocide in Rwanda. And one of the things that you said very early in your talk was that it hadn't been healthy. And Wamaria, uh, it late in her book, describes going back to Rwanda for um, a Remembrance Day ceremony held in a football stadium where, yeah. as you mentioned, um, you know, mass killings had taken place in football stadiums and kind of seeing a performance and articulation of this new narrative. And she says, I did not want to keep telling this story to future generations. Yeah. And in so saying kind of says that that's the framing of her book is telling a different story. And it seems as if that's the framing of your project as, as well. Um, so you, you touched on it a bit, but could you maybe further articulate how these postcards from Rwanda offer a different story from that narrative that has kind of emerged in the last, um, in the last year since the genocide? Um, I think what, what postcards from Rwanda does, it's not possible right now to tell a new story about Rwanda because you, there's no freedom of, of the press. There's no, um, you also can't dissent or you, you know, you'll be arrested like we saw with um, Paul, oh geez, Rusasa, it's a big, I totally, I told you I would butcher his name, the manager of uh, Hotel Rwanda. Um, you know, there are other, there are things that are, for, or there are official forgiveness villages in Rwanda where people were paid coming, like Hutu who had been at genocide, genociders were kind of paid to come and live in villages with the Tutsi people who are willing to forgive them. It's so highly orchestrated. The remembrance ceremony that she refers to um, is, is a highly orchestrated story and told as this kind of national thing. I think that Postcards of Rwanda, uh, Postcards from Rwanda, is trying to chip at the narrative. So it's an interim story, right? I'm, I'm kind of going in there in a very metaphorical way. And I think you, I had a, a journalist in Nairobi who'd seen the work and he wrote to me and he goes, because I write about it very clearly. That's the other thing, y'all, if you want to, the website includes written essays um, about each chapter of the project. And um, he's like, you've said what we can't say. He said, because if I wrote that, I would never be allowed into Rwanda again as a reporter. And he said, you'll probably never be let back in the country if they, if they were to see that. Um, and, and that's just the nature of this particularly autocratic regime. Um, I think there are stories to come. I mean, I know Rwandans who are trying to tell a different story. Um, they're outside the country. They, they have families who have gone through the ritual of forgiving, but who bear a lot of resentment, you know, in their hearts, and they're trying to tell those stories. I don't think you're going to have a really, you know, I mean, until the story comes out about what happened, the way Kagame's forces, you know, massacred Hutus during the genocide, it, it, it's not going to come out. So I, I'm really curious to see what stories come. There's a lot of choices to be made that will determine what those stories are. Um, and the West, you know, unfortunately woke up a little bit late to Kagame and realized he was establishing himself as an autocrat. 
but to me that sort of shows just how ignorant we are kind of like going oh god that's so great look at that african country that we ignored during their genocide and here's this great guy who wants to make business do you know and it's just like wow really that's how we determine you know what makes a country good so that's a really long answer to your question and actually not even a definitive one i would hope that in some way my work serves as an interlude as a questioning of the official narrative as an acknowledgement of the truths of what did happen and compassion for everyone who suffered them and as a suggestion that a different narrative is waiting to be written. Thank you. I think that's, I mean, I think in this idea of aftermath is also a sense that there aren't clear conclusions. Things continue None. to evolve. Um, the other way that I wanted, the other passage I wanted to tie into from this book is actually where um, Wamaria speaks specifically about photographs and she talks about being at a, uh, being on a panel and for a Silicon Valley nonprofit and a kind of Red Cross worker is um, laughing because the refugees want um, photographs and ways to keep, uh, to keep photographs and <sighs> Says it's you know it's not funny. I only had a couple pictures of this entire time. So I think of your story of Gloria, and uh, I think he was saying you know that's not a priority with food and and what safety, oh. physical safety, and um, I think of your story with Gloria and kind of telling telling that story. And I just kind of wonder how um, you mentioned that you sent her links so that she could she could view the project, but how your relationship with the people you make photographs with or make photographs of as you enter these spaces. Um, how do you establish relationships, maintain relationships, collaborate? You, you talked a lot about it with Gloria, but I think more broadly in your work, how do you, how do, you do that? You know, quite often as, a, as the type of photographer in the work I've done as a documentarian, like I don't um, have, if I was covering something for a long period of time, of course there would be, like I'm making a documentary film right now, it's almost finished that I've worked on for five and a half years. I'm in touch with everybody who's in the film. I know how they're doing. I know if anybody's been affected by COVID. Um, but quite often when I'm working, like in the Bosnia work, I would just go and travel to different places throughout that time. It's not like I stayed with one family. There are people who do that and who make sure that they get pictures. If I'm going back to a place, I would bring back pictures. I've done that when I were, I've done some work, a collaborative project with um, an encampment, one of the largest encampments for people experiencing homelessness in the United States. I was able to do it there. Um, I think you build uh, trust in different ways. Quite often, um, especially within my work in Africa, um, when it was working in community, I worked with somebody who was from that area or from that place, you know, to find ways to, to, to be established or to make those connections and to work, you know, respectfully, I would uh, not, you know, you'd wait to take photographs before until people understood or, or you know, were willing to have you um, be there. Um, it's different ways of working in Africa, you know, in, in the West, uh, many, uh, most photographers, I know we, you kind of want to disappear. You want to become a fly on the wall so that people don't know you're there. And w which just from the get go is an utter impossibility for a white, you know, person with a camera in almost all of Africa. There's no way you're ever going to blend into the background. So you, you know, learn to work around that. But I would find when it was somebody I knew through an NGO process, and again, for in this case, and most of the times I was working the internet, this is older work that I'm showing you all, there was no, people, people didn't, have, didn't have access to internet or email. So through an NGO, I might try to reach somebody or send something to them um, or something like that. But I think it's a, I am not in general, the type of photographer who would be like, staying very close to people because that hasn't always been the way I worked. You know, like I said, that's changed more in, in recent years. I think different people answer that differently. Um, yeah, and with Gloria, I was able to see her over a sustained period of time during probably, I mean, I, I made 
probably 13 or 14 trips to Sierra Leone over those few years of making the documentary film and of working on this project. And I was able to, sometimes I would go to where she was to see her and she wasn't there or the phone was broken, but I would always try to leave word. But, you know, sometimes if you know somebody who knows them, they could get word, um, you know, to them. So um, there's one man in the project who was the first amputee of the war in Sierra Leone. And, um, several people wanted to donate money to help him um which and one one uh, family member's friend did that for quite a while so much so that the person who was running the nonprofit that had was part of my connection i was like this is not really helpful you know because his children should be doing something to help now so you have to be really careful and i kept saying that you know like because i to, to my because i'd organized the one fundraiser to help a village rebuild a roof it, it was in this project i you know i'd done that but this person who kept wanting to give i was kind of like eh, it's not like you no know, there are cultural spaces that are so I, working with it through this nonprofit was helpful to me in that way as well great thanks um so we have uh, a question in our, our q a box um and this is from uh, renee nicholson he's actually the director of the humanities center so thank you hi renee me. Um, she asks, how does looking at the images of the aftermath of war change through the lens of a camera or an iPhone as opposed to looking without a frame or without a lens? Is using an iPhone a way to democratize the process or make it accessible to both photo maker and viewer? So I think there's a question about both equipment but also um, photography in general versus just witnessing. It's such an interesting question because I don't know if I could ever answer that because I've, all of my experience of post-conflict has been with a camera in my hand. You know, it hasn't always been in front of my face. Um, I do know that being, spending so much time around the exhumations and the process of remains being laid out and people looking for them, I know that I, I for me personally, I was able to sustain um, my, my discomfort it was like nothing compared to families who were there. It's not an easy space to be in, you know, when you're absorbing, you know, that pain and trying to understand what it looks like. But I know that having a camera was a way that I could maintain a space as much as I was trying to see genuinely and feel it. The camera just, I was working on something. So it wasn't just a pure, you know, absorption. I would kind of break down at later times, you know, something would just hit me out of the clear blue and I would, wind up you know in tears so it's a I, again I, I think somebody else would have to it'd be interesting to have two people talk about that what it's like to see it just without a camera and and for me to see it with a camera and regarding the the iphone um and many i don't know the iphone democratizes photography for a lot of people because they can they can use it it doesn't really change anything for the way that i work because i just treat it as a camera and if it's about being able to the one difference is, would be that i could immediately send a photo to somebody if i wanted to um i would not send the photo to another person that i'm keeping for my project you know that's going to be part of something i'm doing uh, unless it was a photo i had made for them or they had asked for it but i would send them another photo i would say i would share something of what i had seen so that instantness is there but it also happened with dslr cameras the moment you could see a camera on the back of a, a photograph on the back of a camera it changed dynamics and relationships with people which sometimes you could you know would be a really great icebreaker like oh look here's the photo or you know um angry officials you could sort of go oh look i i deleted it but you know and when maybe you hadn't deleted all of them if you needed to hang on to something so i don't know it's a thought it's a it's a thoughtful question um and again that's almost a question that's for people who use it and experience it beyond me i mean i could imagine what it's like for somebody else or talk about it in that level but if it's a question about me and my practice um it doesn't change a lot Thank you. And um, I invite anyone else who has questions to please put them in the in the box there. I'll pose one more, I think, to Sarah while I give people a chance to type. And then um, if, if we don't have further, we'll, we'll wrap up. But I want to give give people the opportunity. Um, so while we see if there are any other outside questions, I think the other thing, the other parallel between um, the text and again, I keep returning to the story of Gloria because I uh, uh, I see these parallels. Uh, Wamaria wrote her book 
uh, with a, a white Western co-author. And um, I'm interested in you maybe elaborating a little bit more. You talk about not about giving voice, but maybe about getting space and platform. Um, and also about the inability of a white Western woman to kind of blend in in an African context as a photographer. And uh, I think just think, uh, what is your um, take on what your role is and maybe what it isn't? Is there any boundary that you wouldn't cross or that you try? Um, I'm sure there are many boundaries you wouldn't cross, but is there, um, as you think about your own kind of racial and cultural position, how that plays into the kind of pictures you take and maybe how you collaborate when you're working with people from the countries you work with? Um, let me think on that. But first I want to say to all of you people out there on Zoom, what drives me absolutely nuts is that I can't see your faces. Because if we were in a classroom or a lecture hall, trust me, I would be looking at different people and I'd be watching you to see how you're responding to what I'm saying. And I would be able to go, oh, you don't agree with that. What do you think? Or I'd be able to look at one of you and say, what are you painting right now? You know, or to one of you in a history class, you know, what, why history? You know, what are you learning about that? What is that telling you about the world? What are you gonna take from it as you go forward? This would be a dialogue between us. And I apologize um, that it's not right now. It drives me nuts. Um, you know, to answer your question as, as best I can, um, you know, I'm, conversations have evolved so much uh in the in a really really healthy and great way over the past year or two and this year in particular you know about representation um and about the imbalance of power and you know who gets to show who and what i think i've always like with my documentary fumble talk I, literally my artist statement says i tried to see the story through their eyes you know because i felt if we could see what they saw that maybe I, as a Westerner, could start to learn this incredible power and act of forgiveness, you know? And so I'm always like humbling myself in that space uh, when I'm in, particularly in those settings of trauma and cultural practices, obviously with the Rwanda work, I'm commenting on that. You know, I'm there as a, as a storyteller with a point of view and I'm taking, I'm, I'm actually kind of taking on Kagami's government in that. So it's a different way of working. But, um, you know, one thing you're acutely aware of, um, it, 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 or you should be, if you work as a, as a white, you know, Westerner in Africa, is just the history of colonialism and the power imbalances and the inherent imbalances. The number of times that, uh, especially when I was making the film in Sierra Leone, I was with the man who started this, the Sierra Leonean, who started this incredible grassroots forgiveness program. People would turn to me and say, to say, oh, thank you so much for bringing this to us. Because they would assume that I was the white Western NGO person or brought money or something. And I would always go, I got nothing to do with it. I'm just here to learn from you all. And it's this man. But so you have to constantly be aware and stepping out. And I'm also aware at times that people would be um, performative for me as, a, as somebody with a camera. And I would just put my camera down, you know, to not instigate a situation or to like, you know, take the heat down. Um, I just think that requires just like a, a certain level of, of, of awareness. I mean, I, when I work in a project in another country in particular, I often read novels and poetry and, and like study the art and I try to know the history to know the context that I'm working and placing myself in and to not be aware of just, I bring all the baggage that walks right next to me you know, as a Westerner in Africa, I'm just always trying to like, you know, put it down, you know, or, or hold it and say to, you know, the person, yeah, go ahead, open that up, unpack it, you know, check out what it means that I'm white. And yeah, I'm from the West. And no, I was not a colonizer personally, but uh, heck yeah, I come from, you know, I have white privilege, I have white elitism. And, I, you know, I come to you as honestly as I can interrogate me, you know, so I just think those doors always have to to be open and you know you just uh, you can do the best you can do you know that that's and I'm always open to being you know critiqued on that or challenged or to learn how to do it better or to do it learn how to do it more honestly or more respectfully thank you yeah. so we have had one other question pop up this one is yes you jumped in who is it 
This one is from Lynn Stahl, who is a librarian. So we still haven't lured the students out of their shelf yet. Students, I'm coming after you. <laughs> Which I, like you, would be um, eking them out of their shelves if we were in person. But, the, uh, but from Lynn, uh, she says, I'm curious about your perspective as a documentarian and photographer on genocide as an object of art. What can representational or fictional art forms such as painting or narrative film or fiction offer that documentary or photography nonfiction can't and vice versa? What kind of ethical issues do you think we need to consider around art and representation of genocide and its consumption? Well, those are also all really part of a lot of conversations right now, but I mean like Guernica would, you know, who, who doesn't think that, that Guernica is one of the most amazing, you know, representations of, of the impact of war like ever made? And, you know, do we need to see that? Yes. I mean, I'm thinking of right now of, of Philippe, um, of Philippe Guston's um, censorship uh, of the art show of his work. Um, the, like the whole, this whole group of museums are like, no, we can't, we're not going to do that because we have to rethink the implications of what this is. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Guston's work, he's incredibly well respected, but he incorporates in his work Ku Klux Klan hoods, but in really critical ways and thoughtful ways. And, and he's not, he's not saying go be a, a KKK person. He's, he's like critiquing it. And, um, so many artists of all colors, like, like wrote to these museums, I mean, top museums in the world saying, D how dare you cancel that show? You know, you canceling it just shows that you as institutions have failed to even understand how to build a conversation around these issues. Don't censor the art for that, you know, you know, put it on yourselves for being able to understand how to have that conversation around it. Um, I think context matters. I think conversations matter. I think education matters. I don't, you know, I, I think we're in a, in such a dangerous spot in the world in which social media can distort and take things out of context and repurpose it for a different use or to use it, you know, for validation for right wing, you know, terrorism beliefs or, you know, um, uh, racial, you know, uh, slurs. It's just, there's, uh, it's why, Oh my God, it's why people have to have visual literacy. It's one of the most intelligences, most important intelligences we could ever have and never more so than in the world that we live in. To know if something is Photoshopped, to know where it came from, to question its authenticity, its validity, who made it, when, why. You know, there's, there's, there's more on us than ever before to know context and there's more on us than ever before in many ways to provide context as, as the artists. I mean, I was never a fan of the traditional art world mode of like, um, you just go see that painting in the museum. And there's a little card that says it's by so-and-so and this is the title and that was the year and that's supposed to be a meaningful experience. Well, I mean, there are plenty of times when I want you to look at my photos and learn about the photo first and then read the caption or, you know, learn, that, learn more about that. And it, Museums are changing so much and providing now so much education and context. So, so that responsibility, you know, goes both ways. But I am way, way, way against censoring images um, because like, oh, that's too sensitive or, oh, no, we don't want to see that. I mean, I do always when I present Eva and Piotr in the, in the exhumation pit, I always stop and let people know what's coming. And then I tell you why it's a photograph of love. I mean, I tell you the horror, I tell you what the evil was that happened there, and then I tell you why I see the humanity in it. So um, I think, I don't even know if that answered your question, and I apologize if it didn't, but it certainly put me off on a rant about it because I think there's, you know, we can, it's, there's just so much knee jerk stuff. I don't, I don't think, I, I absolutely am against censorship of work you know, which leads into a really interesting conversation about Confederacy statues, like should they be taken down and destroyed or should they be kept somewhere and put in context and revealing a part of our history. I lean very much towards the, I don't want somebody telling me, um, like you can see that, but you can't see that. My part two of that is that I absolutely want the context and the space and the history to understand it. Like, I don't think those objects should be in places of glorification. Um, and I certainly think the statues should come down, but that there could be a museum of this is what white supremacy looks like. You know, this is how it happened. These are, look at how art was used to create this message. I mean, those are stories we need to know. 
So yes, Lynn, thank you. I feel a lot about that. And you art history students out there, I hope you're on top of all these things too. And it really truly kills me that I can't be looking you guys in the eyes and asking you for your opinions. So we have we have another question that is it's from an unfamiliar name to me. So it might be a student. I don't know. Oh but yeah, you you're gonna get an award. <laughs> So do you think that the United Nations is a legitimate international organization that has been successful at providing food supplies, medical equipment, and various other assistance packages to impoverished areas in Asia and Africa? Okay, well, that's just loaded as well. You know what? I think our tendency to want yes or no, good or bad, white or black, you know, good and evil answers to things is really complicated. Do we need the United Nations? Yes, we absolutely do. Has the United Nations been an absolutely abusive force in some areas? Have peacekeepers, you know, raped women? Yes, you know, like that's a problem too. I mean, anytime you have a mega institution, it's always gonna be a problem in terms of abuse and waste and things like that. But, oh my God, like, no, you, can you imagine a world without the United Nations? You know, where we don't have a forum to have to discuss things as the world, where we don't have a forum for everybody to put money in to, to make, to get things some places. I mean, there's been an imbalance in years. There's always gotta be course correction. You know, the creation of, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that's been written about um, the impact of Western aid to Africa, like save Africa, you know, back, even back to the, the world aid, um, African famine fundraising stuff, like Bono singing, you know, like, you know, bon the, the magazine covers can Bono save Africa. Like, oh no, I don't think so. But that was a little, you know, a serious news, news magazine cover at the time. But it's, so it, it's created and you see it in a lot of villages, it's created this mentality. There's an industry of, 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 of aid giving and humanitarian aid, which is like, this is the problem and we're gonna fund it. You know, you and all these places. I've worked for NGOs that like, stopped mental health programs, which were deeply needed in Sierra Leone, because their funders wanted them to focus on HIV AIDS funding, which was not a problem in Sierra Leone. But so, so it's a, it, so yeah, there's a lot of problems in it, but balance on it, uh, yeah. We need collective spaces to, to understand what it means to be human and to act on it. So yeah, that, that might have been a professor question. Or if somebody, <laughs> For somebody who's not part of the university, but who follows the news, I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing. <laughs> so again, I'm, I'm not sure uh, where um, uh, some of these people are coming from in terms of their affiliation. So, uh, but this one certainly has a historical bent. Uh, do you think that the discussion and knowledge of the history behind the works you create is just as important as the works that you produce or how do you think the history, um, and you, you've talked about context, so how do you think the history, for example, of the genocide, the Rwandan genocide, um, uh, uh, is, relates to the work that you do, the actual work, so. Uh, good question. So I'm, like first and foremost, I'm a photographer. I make images, do you know? I want you to be able to be drawn into something I'm telling you because of what you see. And then I want you to live in that space for a while. And I want you to read it. You know, quite often when I'm reviewing um, portfolios for photographers, they'll want to sit and talk to me about their work or they'll tell me this picture was that and I was doing that. And just outside the frame, I was doing this. And I will just say, you know, you have got to stop talking because your photographs have a voice. And I literally cannot hear what the photograph wants to tell me if you're talking over it. You have got to respect it. So I see photographs in, as something I, something I want to say as I make it, but then it lives and it has its own voice. And um, I believe um, we have to approach visual art in particular with great humility and a willingness to listen to it first before we tell it what we think. Um, that said, you know, my books, everything, the Africa work in particular, if you go to the website, you'll see it. That work needs writing to go with it. You know, there's a, another chapter called, um, oh gosh, you know what? I think Postcards from Rwanda might be chapter five. I have to double check. The, the, there's a chapter called um, Landscapes from Nelson Mandela's South Africa, which was an exploration of the historical landscapes of South Africa as a way of understanding the reconciliation that has yet to happen there. Um, and the text that goes with each photo matters. And the text, you know, I'm, I, I'm, 
I'm, I, I, in long-term projects, I think that context and history and, and something like post-conflict in particular absolutely has to be rooted in understanding of, um, you know, history and geopolitics and world affairs, but also it has to be understood through poetry and, you know, um, and, and culture and um, the humanities, because otherwise, it, you know, it loses its balance. And Riley, who asked that question, actually chimed in afterwards to say that they're an art history student. So uh, yes, Riley, you're my people. <laughs> my background, I knew more about art than I did about photography when I started. So <laughs> wonderful. And that was the last remaining question in our Q and A um, box. So uh, we'll give a, a going once, going twice. I think that. Uh, We've had some really good conversations with Sarah and very grateful for you for spending your evening or I guess your, your late afternoon out there in, in LA. With afternoon. And I didn't get to say at the beginning, which I meant to do, just a you know, big thank you to all of you and to Todd you know, for thoughtfully curating a program and for inviting me to be part of it. It's you know, always a, an honor when somebody asks you to, to talk about things like this and, and ropes in students to, um, to have to have to be part of the conversation, but I appreciate it very much. Um, and and I and and truly, I'm I'm hoping for all of us that we uh, have a return to beauty and light. And I think that that is a perfect way to close. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you again to the Humanities Center and to Sarah. And we wish you all a very good evening. And we hope you all stay well. <laughs>